Thank you for turning to Tim from NBC 10 News. Welcome to a Decision 2022 debate, the Democratic race for U.S. Congress. Live from our NBC 10 studios, here is moderator Gene Valicenti. And hello again, everyone. I'm Gene Valicenti. Welcome to our Decision 2022 primary debate with the Democrats for Congress, the 2nd Congressional District. Let's get right to it. From left to right, Omar Ba. Joy Fox, General Treasurer, Seth Magaziner, Sarah Morgenthau, and David Siegel. Spencer Dickinson is not able to join us because he's hospitalized and recovering from an unplanned medical procedure. We wish him the best. We're dispensing with opening statements, though we will have closes. Our question to candidates, we're free to exchange back and forth in a civil fashion. We hope it's largely up to them, though, to defend themselves and fact check and engage each other. I'm here to moderate and keep it moving. All right, let's get right to it with the questions. Our timekeepers in the back will do their best to keep things balanced. First question, we're going to go to the left here. Omar Ba, what are you bringing down to Washington? Congressman Cicilline wants to bust up the social media monopolies. Senator Whitehouse is an expert in climate change. Jack Reed, foreign affairs. Jim Langevin with cybersecurity. What's your niche? What are you bringing? I want to be the democ democracy police because I've lived under a dictatorship where democracy fell. Right. And I saw what it takes for people to lose their freedoms and their rights and the results that ensue. So I want to fight to defend democracy and I want to be a first advocate for every American in the district, in the street, right. and across the United States. Right. Let America. me just challenge, there is no democracy police committee. What is your <laughs> expertise? What is your area? I just listed four yeah. that our members are very adept at. What is yours? Well, mine is a lived experience because we cannot have uh, a, a system where people would attack the government, attack the seat of power on mm -hmm. January 6th, and given my experience living both under democracy and under dictatorship, my area is to be a fierce advocate to protect democracy okay. and defend that democracy and freedom. Right. Very good. I hit that by mistake. We have a bell in case we get a little <laughs> too raucous here. I'll keep it over here so I don't hit it. Joy Fox, you just heard me out loud. You work for Congressman, Congressman Langevin, Mr. Cybersecurity himself. What's your level of expertise and niche? Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I bring deep expertise um, having worked for Congressman Langevin and Governor Gina Raimondo and running a small business now. And one thing that I think we need down in Washington is an advocate um, for families. People are struggling right now. So what can we do to make sure that everyone can live and work here in Rhode Island? I think there are a couple things there. One is making sure paid leave becomes permanent. It worked during the pandemic and we should extend it. Family caregivers is another important area for yep. me. Um, my dad has Alzheimer's. My mom is his primary caregiver. And um, we'd be lost without the Cranston Adult Day Services, uh, providing her some respite and, okay. and him, him some care as well. So it's taking care about our, our families um, throughout the lifespan. So I mean, universal pre-K, uh, extending the child right. tax credit, paid permanently, family caregiving. Okay, uh, family, social thing. services, things like that. Yeah, okay. exactly. Tre Treasurer Magaziner. Well, thank you for having us and thank you everyone for watching. Um, I'm running for Congress because I want to make it easier for working people to get ahead and build a good, stable life. My grandparents were all children of immigrants. They grew up poor in the Great Depression. They went and fought in World War II. When they came home, they got jobs that were not glamorous. My right. grandfather, Bob, was a steel worker. My grandfather, Lewis, was a bookkeeper. But here's the point. With those jobs, they were able to buy houses, put kids through college, and build a middle-class life. Today, working people are working harder and harder and aren't able to keep up the cost of living. You're going to, so make, my, me, you're going to make me work tonight. The question well, was, what's so your no. area of expertise? We've dispensed with opening yeah. statements. So, so what's your specialty? In my time as state treasurer, I have fought to raise wages, to lower health care costs, and to bring jobs to Rhode Island. I'm going to bring those same sets of experiences and those same priorities to Washington. Okay. Sarah Morgenthau, what's your area of expertise? I just listed all four. You know, we know Senator Whitehouse, climate change. We know Jim Langevin, cybersecurity, Jack Reed, military affairs, foreign affairs. What's yours? You know, Gene, thank you, and, and thank you to the viewers uh, for tuning in tonight. Uh, this could not be a more critical time. I have a heck of a lot of experience. I have worked for two presidents. I have worked for Obama. I was at Homeland Security, where I worked on cybersecurity, where I worked on domestic terrorism, uh, where I worked on natural disasters, something that we know a thing or two about here in Rhode Island. I headed up travel and tourism for the United States of America. That's about $7 billion uh, coming into the economy here in Rhode Island. That's a heck of a lot of jobs and a heck of a lot of economic benefits. So, so I what, should I put you down for travel and tourism? That would be your niche if I have a, a, a particular question. I call you for that, travel and tourism? 
Well, absolutely, Jane. If okay. you want to talk about travel and tourism, I'd be happy to do that. But oh. I have, you know, experience on cybersecurity, domestic terrorism, okay. uh, it, travel and tourism for sure, uh, and, and a global perspective, All you right. know, working at the Peace Corps for, for over 50 countries. David Siegel, you've heard the question now four <laughs> different times. I'm looking for an area of expertise. Yours Thank you, Jude. Say that again? An area okay. of expertise. Yours is? Mine will is. Be. So I, I've, I've been fortunate to get to work on many issues, maybe essentially every issue of the day over the course of my time uh, in doing this work. I mm -hmm. served as a local lawmaker, state lawmaker, and have spent the last 10 years as a national advocate. So I've worked on everything from workers' rights to renewable energy to civil rights to fairer taxes. And the theme that runs throughout, and here's your answer, <laughs> is that we only make progress on these issues if we're, able, if we're able to overcome corporate special interests and political corruption that rule the day in Rhode Island and also rule the day nationally. And so the thing I've learned how to do is build coalitions that are broad enough to push back against the corporate special interests that have too much control over what happens and does not happen in Congress. Okay, he's mentioned corporate special interests. You mentioned that in today's radio debates. Can you give me a specific, if the Petroleum Institute wants to sit down with you, is that a corporate special interest? Will you not meet with them? They, they, I would say that they are a corporate special interest. I would meet with them, but I would prioritize what is best for the people of Rhode Island over what they want. And you know, for instance, this is uh, why I signed the No Fossil Fuel Pledge, I'm not taking any money from people uh, related to the fossil fuel industry from executives okay. and from lobbyists and so on. All right, let's open it up. Let's mix it up. Joy Fox, Petroleum Institute wants to meet with you. Important things to talk about. We pay gas taxes here in Rhode Island. You would do what? What does the bell mean in this uh, case, Jane? No, I've got to move it to this side. I'm left-handed. Oh, I'm left-handed, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, you should meet with everyone that wants to, you know, this is about bringing people around a table to better just to make better decisions. Yep. Um, but I agree with David. It's about what's right for Rhode Islanders, and, and we need to transition to a clean energy economy. Um, and that would be my top priority in meeting with them. How do we make that transition in a fair and just way so that Rhode Islanders can live and work here? Seth Magaziner, uh, broadcasting is a special interest. We have lobbyists yeah. Down there, would, would you meet with us and any other yeah. interested party who Listen, pays their taxes and behaves? Sure. In my time as state treasurer, I've had an open door policy. I'll meet with anyone who has a good idea or something they want to advocate for, and I'll work with Republicans, Democrats, and anyone in between to get things done. But but I'm glad that you brought up the petroleum example because yeah. I do think this is one of the top issues in this race. The big oil companies have made more than a hundred billion dollars of profits this year, not revenue, profits while Rhode Islanders are getting gouged at the gas pump. So we do need leaders in Washington, and I intend to be one, who will crack down on this price gouging and make sure that some of that money that's going to oil industry profits goes back into people's pockets. Okay, so, uh, Omar Bob, what do you know about corporate special interests, and are they as sinister as David Siegel makes them sound? Well, well absolutely, uh, I agree with the treasurer here. People have been hurting since this uh, war in Ukraine started. And that is not because of gas shortage. It is because special interests, corporate special interests, are profiting out of the current situation. Who who are we, those corporate special interests profiting? Who who's that? The, the, the drone makers. The oil oil that companies. We, we, no, send, the, we send the drones to Ukraine. Is that a wrong thing? No 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 no. The oil companies that are that are profiting right. out of gas prices that should not be that price. Okay. I know it's coming down a little bit, but the fluctuation has hurt families, and I work with these families every day. People are struggling to buy gas. The price of food has tripled or, or doubled since the uh, war in Ukraine started. And those are the things that we are fi going to fight to ensure that corporate special interests are tackled. Okay. So that area, I agree with him because it is something that we need to take care of. Sarah Morgenthau, you have all the Washington experience. You know about corporate special interests. Are they as sinister as David makes them sound? Look, what we need to turn to right now is what the voters need, okay? They need somebody who's a problem solver, who has that experience in Washington. But right now, what I'm hearing when I'm going from community to community is everything is too darn expensive. Housing's too expensive, gas too expensive, groceries is too expensive, and education is, is, is unaffordable. Mm -hmm. We need to have somebody who can go to Washington and be a problem solver, and I have done that, whether it's with domestic terrorism or cybersecurity. When I reopen travel and tourism, for the United States of America. We work closely uh, with, with industry as well as mm -hmm. the CDC and the White House and the State Department. So I think it's important that you bring the people around the table together so that you can solve problems and ultimately bring back things uh, here for folks in Rhode Island, which is, is what we're being sent there for. Go ahead, David. And I would, of course, argue that 
much of why we are facing so many problems in the realm of inflation. Otherwise, it's a function of the power that we've afforded these large corporations. There's been an acceleration of monopolization over the course of recent decades. And we can take something as basic as the baby formula crisis. Like this happened in part because that market is effectively a duopoly. You know, Abbott has, I think, a 43% market share. They were able to, as powerful interests frequently do, captured their regulators, so the people in the regulatory structure uh, had too close a relationship with them for a number of different reasons. Um, they were not cracked down upon when it was clear that they were allowing contamination to fester in one of their plants. So eventually they had to shut the whole thing down. Right. And it made life more difficult and put all of these people in a horrendous experience where they had to worry about whether or not they were going to be able to feed their babies. So okay. the problem solving in this case entails cracking down on those corporate special interests. The way I, I would reported, also argue the too, way it's I important. The, the way I reported the news was that the Biden administration dropped the ball on keeping an eye on the baby formula factory. Is that the way you understand the narrative, what, Joy? Um, it, the baby formula narrative is one that, um, yes, people should be held responsible That'd be for. That'd the Biden administration dropped the ball on the baby formula factory. Would you agree to that? Uh, yes, okay. I would. Um, that's unacceptable. Um, families here in Rhode Island um, suffered for that and paid the price for that. Um, since that, though, I think we've seen, um, you know, these are the things that happen when you're in government and you have to be able to deal with the unexpected. I do have that experience. And I think since the baby formula incident, right. um, we've seen tremendous pieces of legislation passed from um, to promote climate change, prescription, affordable pres prescription drug prices, okay. veterans health care. Um, and to add on to David's point, too, the other reason um, why it is important um, and how we push back on corporate interests for Rhode Island families is to keep this seat blue. Okay, now you're all Democrats. Is anybody uh, afraid to push back against the Biden administration? They they dropped the ball with the baby well, formula, well, right, well, well, absolutely not. I run a center that serves hundreds of people every day. And just yesterday, somebody dropped a bag of baby formulas. And that is because they know the people I work with cannot afford this. I work with single mothers every day who are struggling to afford basic food. And baby formula is one of the most expensive things. Mm -hmm. I'm not uh, held to the dogma of political parties or uh, principles. I'm held to the truth. If Biden drops the ball, we yeah. call it out. And I think that is what happened in this case. Interesting. How about you, yeah. Treasurer? But I just say that real leaders don't just point fingers. They come up with ideas and work with people to fix problems and get things done. So on inflation and the cost of living, I have a plan of what I will fight for. I will fight to crack down on price gouging. I'm in favor of temporarily suspending the gas tax to give people some relief. We need to cap the cost of prescription drugs, not just in Medicare, okay. but in private insurance as well. These are things that will make a real difference in people's lives that I'm going to fight for in Congress. So look, we can finger point, we can throw blame around. That's what politicians do too much of. Right. I want to be somebody who actually tackles problems, gets results, as I've done as state treasurer for the last eight years. Yeah, I yeah, understand. I think, I think people all, appreciate, me, I think people appreciate that, but we also have to find the facts, Sarah Morgan. So do you agree the Biden administration dropped the ball with the baby formula? You're not afraid to admit that or, or agree with that? Look, on the baby formula issue, that was a catastrophe. Uh, you know, we had enormous supply chain issues. No family uh, should not be able, should have to go to the grocery store and, and not be able to get uh, baby formula. I'm the mother of three children. I know a thing or two about this. And it, it, it would be an absolute disaster if it wasn't there. So I think that the Biden administration did what they needed to do, and we used the Defense Production Act and uh, collaborated and, mm -hmm. and turned things around. We went through a very difficult period, uh, and uh, you know Biden had a, a, a difficult hand turned to him, but I think we have seen recently uh, some tremendous um, successes with the infrastructure bill, uh, with okay. the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Right. And by the way, Gene, I was the only one uh, who's standing on the stage who said that I supported um, President Biden uh, running in 2024, several weeks ago, when his numbers were, were a little bit okay. lower. All right. Uh, David Siegel, I'm going to just let you answer quickly on, on the Biden administration dropping the baby formula ball, but then I want to start with you on kind of flipping it and what will you take from Washington and bring back to us? So quickly on the baby formula. So on the baby formula front, uh, embedded in my answer, the, I guess that started yeah. this whole last phase of the conversation, <laughs> was the notion that yes, the regulators were too close with the industry, okay. unless it did not intervene fast enough. And this happens, this replicates across all different portions of the government. And I agree with you, we need to identify problems before we fix them. I think, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I've got a broad uh, track record of building coalitions mm -hmm. and moving agendas forward and many, many pieces of legislation in Rhode Island at the city level and the state level have, for instance, passed under my name as lead sponsor or co-sponsor. So yeah. I agree we need to do that. 
I also agree we need to understand what's wrong with the system in order to make that happen. All right, let me work right to left now. I asked you what you will bring to Washington. Yeah. What will you bring home? Jack Reed just <laughs> so, brought us $50 million right. yesterday to fix the roads and so bridges what, what, immediately. That's a big part of your job, bringing home the bacon. Yeah, you agree with that? I, I agree with that, and I, th I think the foremost way to do it that impacts the greatest oh. number of people is to help support broad-based programs like Medicare for all, for all, like a Green New Deal, that will, you know, in the, in the former case, will lower health care costs while expanding coverage to include all Rhode Islanders mm -hmm. at no or very limited cost. In the context of the Green New Deal, will help us transition to a renewable energy economy, create tons of jobs here, mean we won't have to deal with gas price driven inflation ever again, and where we might benefit disproportionately because of our extraordinary access, extraordinary relative access to wind. So I'd be working on issues where, yes, there might be disproportionate mm -hmm. benefit for Rhode Islanders, but I think the thing that people care about most is feeding their family and making sure that they, their communities, can flourish. And I'd be pushing for those kinds of programs. Okay, Sarah Morgenthau, the congressperson, has to bring back for the second district Quonset fire trucks, fire boats, all kinds of grants. They're on the news every day. Do you agree with that? No, absolutely, Gene. You know, and and my job is look, folks are hurting. Okay, things are too darn expensive, and we need a fighter. And by the way, we've never had a Democratic woman go to Congress uh, from Rhode Island. I think we need a fresh perspective, not a career politician maybe a mother's perspective. I have a heck of a lot of experience in Washington, and I see my job absolutely as fighting like heck to bring mm -hmm. resources back for people here. That's what they deserve. Uh, kind of, uh, Treasurer Magaziner, uh, I'm just going to ask you, you mentioned we need a woman, yeah. a Democratic woman. Do we, or we just need the best person? That might be you. Well, listen, nothing would set back the cause of women more in this country than if Kevin McCarthy and Alan Fung and the Republicans take control of Congress because they are hell-bent on passing a national abortion ban and turning back the clock, and we can't let that happen. So I'm in this race to make sure we keep the seat blue. To answer your original question about bringing back resources yeah. to Rhode Island, huge priority for me, and there's a number of things that I would focus on. Uh, number one, investing in our public colleges and universities, URI, RIC, CCRI. Uh, these are important economic centers for our state and also pathways for opportunity. So bringing back resources for public institutions of higher education. Another, uh, the clean energy economy, including offshore wind. We can create a lot of good jobs by transitioning to renewable energy so that we're not dependent on Vladimir Putin right. and Saudi Arabia for our energy supply. And the final thing I'd say on this is, uh, you know, I think this is probably areas where all of us would agree that, you know, investing in URI and, and RIC and CCRI mm -hmm. and clean energy and Quonset and infrastructure are all things that we want to prioritize. Yeah. Um, but I do think what sets me apart is that I've spent the last eight years as state treasurer yeah working to deliver resources to these places. I work as state treasurer on the higher education bonds, okay, on the green gonna, economy bonds. So I know what the needs are because I've been working with these institutions and with these communities for eight years. I'll get into that. I just, are you going to take the bait on maybe we just need the best person, not necessarily a woman? Do you want to address that? I think the move? most important thing we can do, and, and by the way, this is an important issue, right? I mean, choice is on the ballot this yeah. year. Equal pay is on the ballot this year. And the most important thing that we can do is keep the seat in the Democratic column. That's why I'm in the race. All right, didn't necessarily take the bait. Joy Fox, you agree with Sarah, it's time to send a woman down, Democrat 100%. woman. Now, why 100%. is that? What about just the best person? The Democratic woman from Rhode Island in this case is the best person. I've been on the t uh, part of a team that's beaten Alan Fung twice. I understand the urgency of keeping this seat blue as well. And I also have the experience of being out in the community, understanding needs, and um, bringing those resources back as well, working for Congressman Langevin as well as Gina Raimondo. And I run a small business now here too, so I understand um, how our economy works and what that means for me as a small business person. Right. But yes, choice is on the ballot. Um, and we need to send a woman down there to fight like, um, <laughs> sorry, Sarah, fight like heck. <laughs> All right, fight like heck. Whatever. Oh, my boss. Just my Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But, um, but yes, no, it, 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 it I, is I important. And, um, you yeah. know, we need to, to um, get this done okay. once and for all. Omar Ba, you may say it's time to send an African American to Congress from uh, Rhode Island. Uh, absolutely. That's what why I was so coming. I, mean, that. I, I think it is the time to send the right person, the best person to represent Rhode Island, uh, particularly the second district. And that does not have to be an African-American, a black person, or a woman. It should be the best person. But certainly, it will be great to have the first African-American represent Rhode Island. Uh, it will be historic, and Rhode Island will mm -hmm. be taking the lead. I'm uh, coming to your original question about what I will bring from Washington. Yes. You know, you cannot, everybody says the same thing. You cannot bring anything from Washington if you cannot work with people, if you cannot go across the aisle, if you cannot build coalitions. And I, all my life, that's, that's what I've done. 
building bridges between Americans and refugees and immigrants, between police and communities, mm -hmm. addressing community public safety. So I want to go to Washington to address one of the most intricate issues, which is an issue of housing. I believe housing is at the center of most of the economic okay. challenges facing people. Bring in money and 500 million, half a billion dollars, may sound a lot, it is not a lot, will solve the entire okay. housing problem in Rhode Island. It will address uh, homelessness, it will address the okay. low stock in housing and apartments. And I want to extend that to fight to make gentrification and NIMBY illegal because I think those touch on racial Gen systems. Gentrification, which is the, the moving the population of one neighborhood to another. All right, Joy Fox, you want to get in on this? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to answer the investment question. What would you bring home? Um, yes, yeah, yeah. I think that there's a couple of things. Workforce, investments in workforce development, uh, infrastructure, we just passed a huge infrastructure bill. Um, that would tie into climate, which is the, the other bill that passed. I completely agree on housing. Um, and mental health supports as well. And um, I too have that experience working with Congressman Langevin's office, in Congressman Langevin's office um, across the aisle on both cybersecurity and uh, for family caregivers as well. Let's move to inflation. Larry Summers was the Treasury Secretary under Bill Clinton, top economic advisor to President Obama, said we threw too much free money under President Biden at free programs, and that's why we overheated the economy. Student loans are going to do the same thing. So do you share that view, Treasurer Magazine? Larry uh, Summers, yeah. he knows a lot. I don't. If there's too much money at the system, in the system, it's at the very top where you have billionaires shooting rocket ships into space while paying a lower tax rate than a lot of working people. You know, I, I meet with people all over the state, people who are struggling to get by, who are struggling to pay their bills, living on $13, $14, $15 an hour, and they're not able to keep up. Um, I think it is wrong to blame those working people and say that inflation is their fault because they got a stimulus check a year ago. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. That being said, inflation is a real problem, which is why, again, as a member of Congress, I will take a results-oriented approach to combating inflation, lowering gas costs, lowering the cost of food, the cost of health care. There are real policies we can pass that will do that, and that is going to be a high priority for me because right. people need it. I don't think Larry was blaming the people who received the check. He was blaming the notion that we're just pumping too much free money out. Sarah Morgan, though, you've heard that. I asked you that on 10 News Conference. You did ask me that, and what I say is that education is the most important investment that we can make in our young people and in this country. And so I think President uh, Biden's uh, decision uh, to do the loan forgiveness was absolutely what we needed. And there is uh, evidence uh, that uh, this will allow uh, some uh, important um, relief to people who are mm -hmm. trying to pay off their debt and that they will then put it into the economy and that becomes a stimulus because instead they can uh, not have to pay that, uh, go get a job and continue. And again, I say education is the most important thing that we can do to invest in what the, is is the greatest country in the world. Okay, David Siegel, uh, nobody agrees with Larry Summer, the last two. Larry Summers, he's the top guy, he said. We overheated I, the I, economy. I disagree Explain that he's him. the top guy. I'm very glad he's not the top guy. Part of why I'm endorsed by Elizabeth Warren and by our revolution, the organization that Bernie Sanders started, is work to try to ensure that the Biden administration was populated with people who would put the public interest first. We helped keep Larry Summers out of the administration because he helped architect the bailout to the banks after the last crisis. So he's not somebody who I have a lot of faith in when it comes to these issues. I think we've seen many countries where there's inflation and also no meaningful recovery or lesser recovery than we've had here. Inflation is a huge problem, but imagine if we ended up in a situation where we saw inflation without a recovery and the unemployment rate and the circumstance we'd be in. So I think that the stimulus was very important, and I say that as somebody who served in the assembly during the financial crisis right. where there was not sufficient stimulus, and we need to attack inflation by going at price gouging, by ex at excess profits, um, at reducing the ability of monopolies to have pricing power in our economy and through transitioning to a green energy economy so we don't deal with gas price driven inflation again down the line. Let's take Larry Summers out. Janet Yellen was, wasn't crazy about student loan forgiveness either. Do you like Janet Yellen? She um, said she's, she, I, she, she didn't I, go along with it either yeah, on the I, student loan. How about her? I, I disagree with her on this one. Okay. Happy to have a policy disagreement with her. All right, um, that's, that's I, I think that 40 million people have benefited from this program and it's part of a necessary you know, suite of policies to put in place to make the economy fairer for everybody. Okay, uh, Joy Fox, Larry Summers, Janet Yellen, they both agreed it's overheating the economy, making inflation worse. 
to me, this is about making sure Rhode Island is a place where people can live and work. And whatever it, we're facing, a pandemic, an inflation, or a recession, the bottom line is here, this economy will be in transition for a very long time. So how are we preparing mm -hmm. um, the people of Rhode Island to live and work here for that? And I do think that there are short-term things to do, things that work during the pandemic, like the child uh, tax credit, uh, universal free lunch in schools, for example, and um, and, perma and paid leave. Um, looking to the long term, it's everything that I've been talking about tonight, workforce development. Okay. We need to make sure that people here are ready to make that transition to a clean energy economy and to participate um, and be able to raise a family here. And we, it also goes down to education as well. If we send well. you to Washington, you have to vote on tremendous aid packages. Mm -hmm. Half a billion, a trillion dollars. And mm -hmm. Larry says you overheated the economy, th threw too much out. You have to consider what he says, along with Janet Yellen, wasn't crazy about the student loan forgiveness. Well, last Address I those checked, two specifically. Last I checked, Larry wasn't voting for any of us here because he's not a Rhode Islander. So it's a matter of bringing everyone around a table and making the de best decisions with people in the community on what those packages look like in the future. Okay, I, I, you're, I understand. You're willing to ignore Larry. I think you've made yes, that. Yes, I'm willing to that. ignore Larry. All right, there, we have the headline tonight. How about you, Omar Bond? You give him any credence or Janet Yellen? Uh, I have so much respect for them, but I do not agree at that point because what they just said, say that to the single woman that I work with who used those checks from child tax credits mm -hmm. to pay for child care so that they can do two jobs to take care of their families. You know, uh, this sounds more like Reaganomics, tops down, top-down economics. I'm from the doctrine of bottom-up economics where you pump money into the grassroots, help those single mothers, help working class families, mm -hmm. like the hundreds of people have put in jobs already this year, and most of them receiving $15 an hour, $16 an hour, the max, yeah. $14 an hour. We want minimum wage in this country so that people can re receive at least $19 or $20 an hour to be able to live uh, normal lives, okay. to be able to take care of themselves. That is not pumping money into the economy. We need child tax credits to be permanent. Mm -hmm. We need to pump, uh, bring some sort of gas rebate so that it can be permanent, but also support women with some early child care support and child, child care trainings and education. And uh, we need also developmental education. Okay. This is de very uh, tough for people who do not understand some of these issues, how to address issues of developmental dis uh, ed education. All right. Job trainings also need to be there so mm -hmm. that we can have people to be trained in particular industries, then they can work in a company in the job market. Okay, a couple of shorter answers. Now we'll continue with the format. Uh, show of hands, who's for taxing the rich? Wow, we have, a, we have consensus <laughs> here. Uh, Omar Ba, who, is, who are the rich you tax? Who do you want to go after? Who? Well, I uh, will start with those who are trying to explore uh, these stars because we have got enough money to uh, do such things okay. because that money can go in. Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Absolutely. the rocket ship guy. And okay. certainly people like Donald Trump because if there is a reason why he does not want to show his taxes, probably somebody like right. me is paying more taxes than him. Okay, Joy Fox, who would you want to tax? You know, Helena Bonanno, folks, she told me I think she paid millions and millions one year. Do you want more out of her? Um, if she's, if she has it, yeah, actually. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, it, the guys going to space need to fe pay their fair share. Yeah. Um, and there are plenty of people in that income bracket as well that need to pay their fair share. Seth Magazine, when you yeah. tax the rich, don't they just charge us more for what they're selling? No, not if you have strong government and strong oversight. Let me be clear about something. Yeah. I would not support increasing taxes on any family making less than $400,000 a year. That's okay. a red line for me, right. as I know it has been for the president. Um, but for people making millions millions or billions of dollars, they need to pay their fair share. They need to pay their fair share so that we can rebuild our country, rebuild our infrastructure, bring manufacturing jobs back, and support families. So, yeah. absolutely. And Sarah Morgenthau, I don't know if you heard that exchange I had with Helena Banana folks a while ago. She made a lot of money uh, last year, and she told me she paid an enormous amount of taxes, millions. What would you say to her? She did the right thing. If she's yeah. paying taxes on it and what she earned, then, then that makes a, makes a lot of sense. You want so, more out of her? I, I think we need to make sure that, um, that, that people who are, have a lot of money are, are paying their fair share of taxes. So we've got a lot of people uh, who are hurting here. Things are too expensive. Uh, we need to make sure that we have affordable housing, that we have uh, groceries and fuel, that we've got supply chain uh, in our uh, in our markets, right? And so we can't, we have to, we have to make choices. That's okay. how it always is. Uh, David, uh, you tax the rich. Who, who are you going after and what so, would you like? <laughs> so I, I think that we have myriad <laughs> programs we need to fund, as I spoke to earlier, including Medicare for All, including a Green New Deal. 
One proposal that I like is the Elizabeth Warren ultra millionaires tax, which I believe kicks in at a wealth of $50 million a year. And it's a fraction of a percentage point. No, it's a little bit more than that. Um, but would raise on the order of $300 billion a year, if I have the math right. And we would take that money and use it to fund programs that are a broad benefit to our communities. Okay, Omar, but if you tax the rich, don't they just charge more for what they sell us to get rich? Well, I need I'm, another nickel because they're taking it out of this pocket. I want to fill that. Isn't that the way economics that, works? That is how it should not be. Uh, why it should not be going like that. But it does it, is it like that? If you tax the rich yeah. man more, he just charges you more for the whatever because he Because we let them. That's why we want people who can represent the people in Congress. People who will fight to stop that. There must be regulations. There must be legislation that can curb this, this kind of activity. Yeah. It is not like you've taken money from them and now they'll find another way to get it from the people. And I guess that is how it is right now. And the only person that is not protected is the people, the, the people who are hurting, the people who are at the bottom of the income chain. Go ahead, Seth. So, no, that's not the way economics works. Go I'm ahead. a state treasurer. I, yeah. I can tell you this. You know, the way an economy is supposed to work is you have competition. Right. I didn't say supposed and, to. No, it's no, no. How, it, yeah, and so, ahead. and so, if you want to get around the problem of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk just charging us more, right. then the way to address that is to have tougher antitrust oversight so that there's actual competition in the economy. Uh, this is something that, as you noted, David Cicilline has been fighting for, um, David uh, Siegel and others have been fighting for, and rightfully so. Um, so, no, look, it's morally wrong that you have billionaires paying a lower tax rate than firefighters and teachers and nurses. Wrong. But one of the ways that you get around what you're talking about, the price gouging problem, yeah. is by being tough on antitrust, just like Teddy Roosevelt knew to do over 100 years ago. We've got to go back to that. Okay, Sarah, do you want to get in on this? That, that well, theory that if you take your tax some more, he just charges more. Yeah, I mean, I disagree. And I, and I think, you know, Warren Buffett talks about this, the importance of, you know, the very rich uh, need to be taxed and they have, to have their fair mm -hmm. share because there are too many uh, people who are, you know, can't afford things and we need to make sure that we have the resources. We need to make sure that we have the money to fund programs uh, so that, you know, everyday Americans can have have a, a, a good life. You know, I worry uh, at night thinking about what's going to happen in the winter when, you know, middle class are going to start to slip into poverty because they can't afford to heat their houses. Uh, I worry about, you know, whether or not uh, everyday Americans are going to be able to afford, uh, you know, rent or, or to buy a house. Uh, you know, Rhode Island has extraordinarily high prices, both for rentals um, and for buying okay. homes, and we need to be able to do something about it. Right, speaking of homes and houses, Pat show of who lives in the second district right now? Now you moved, right? You just moved back. You told me you would, yes. Seven months out of the life. Seth, are you renting a house? Yes. And you, you, you rented a house. Yes. Some people are a little chuckling about that, that you rented a house for the election. You want to just address that? Yeah. You, I mean, you I've have served, a house in the I've first served, district. Yeah, look, I've served the district for the last eight years as state treasurer. I've worked in every community across the second congressional district from Burrillville to Westerly and everywhere in between with people to solve problems. And I know the second congressional district and the issues that people are facing better than anyone else. I made a commitment to move back to the district where I had lived and worked and voted for several years before. Mm -hmm. I kept that commitment. And when I am out and about talking to people, uh, this doesn't come up. What comes up is people are worried that if Republicans take control of Congress, they're going to lose their right to choose, yeah. lose their health care, lose their Social Security. Those are the issues that I'm well, focused on because if, those are the issues that most people are focused if on. If it's not important, why did you rent a house in the second district? Because I made a commitment and I keep my commitments. So for just, political so opportunity and for political gain. No, because it's the yes, right thing to do. Yes, you were running for governor and then this was yeah. the easier way to go, so mm -hmm. you decided to move over here yeah. where there was an easier path. No, I, no look, I, I'm running for, uh, for Congress because I want my son to grow up in a democracy that functions well. I want my son to grow up in a world where we've turned the page on climate change and where there's opportunity for everyone. Joy, I, I, I care deeply about the future of our country and our state. And that's why it's so important that we keep the seat in democratic control and we uh, bring Rhode Island values to Washington. That's why I'm in this race. I sent you one of those chuckling when you heard he rented a house in the second district. I don't know that I was chuckling. It was more um, about political opportunity. I'm here because I believe in serving my community, a community that I have grown up in and mm -hmm. I work in now. Um, and 
and I think it is important that if you want to represent a place that um, you are there every day and you and you can be a part of it um, and to me this is about service this is about going to Washington for for my neighbors all of my neighbors and um, I wasn't running for anything else Does I that, didn't decide to run for governor and then change my mind when the seat opened and jumped over here right. and that is there there's something to be said for that. This the, is about opportunity, political opportunity, and political gain. Does that go for Omar Ba? He just moved back to the district. No, it doesn't go for Omar uh, How about uh, Sarah Morgan, though, who's been accused of being a carpetbagger? Yes, I think it does. I think you need to be a part of a community. I think the first time you vote for yourself shouldn't be the f when you register to vote. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is something to be said for understanding not only how to move policy forward, but um, also working with the community to do that. And I have that deep experience having worked for Congressman Langevin yeah. and Governor Raimondo okay. and also covering the community uh, Sarah, as a community newspaper reporter. Sarah Morgenthau, the New York Times used that term for you. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to address this. Uh, Rhode Island has been my home for 40 years. It is where my mother, uh, who was an immigrant to this country, ran in 1988. And while my heart is here in Rhode Island, my experience has been everywhere. And it's exactly that experience that I will bring to bring back results uh, for folks here in Rhode Island. I know your heart is here. You say it's been your home. You, you didn't go to high school here. You didn't go to college here. You spent most of your adult life elsewhere. How, how do you square that? Go ahead. I, I spent, mean that in a respectful way. It's an issue for you. I spent it everywhere. And what I say is that that experience, working, serving in my, uh, serving my country for two presidents, yeah. for Obama and for Biden, uh, working on homeland security, cybersecurity, domestic terrorism, travel and tourism, uh, it, the global experience that I have gotten from the Peace Corps uh, is, are all important uh, experiences that I will use so that I can go on day one and, and deliver. Okay, uh, David Siegel, I don't see you that excited by this as an issue. You didn't sound that uh, excited on the radio today. Not an issue for you? I, I think the biggest issue is whether or not people are engaged in their community mm -hmm. and understand the values of the community, the needs of their community. And I've spent my adult life, uh, it, much of it as an elected official, including parts of it representing parts of District 2, helping to forward causes that I think are important to the people of Rhode Island at the local level and at the state level and at the national level. And you know, voters are free to make up their minds mm -hmm. based on whatever criteria they see fit, but I think the criteria I just named are ones that uh, go to people's hearts in this moment. Omar Ba, you moved back to the second district yeah. recently. You told me the story you had to leave because the house, you had to house your brothers and sisters and you temporarily moved. Now you're back. Was, was it important to you to move back to the second or no big deal? No, absolutely not. I agree with Joy there. It is important that the first time you're voting for yourself for something, that you live in a place where you are voting. But I think, um, I don't know what the experience was for Seth uh, moving to the district, but it was, for me, it was the best, it was the easiest. I work with people who are being gentrified, who are moving from one place to the other because they cannot afford where their parents and generations of their families right. lived. That is the hurtful movement that matters to me right now, not me moving okay. from one place to the other. You have quite other. a compelling story. You yeah. tell how you fled Africa, dictatorships, mm -hmm. you were tortured, you came here, you came to the United States legally. Absolutely. And what a success you are. PhD from Harvard, I think we all congratulate you on that. You're the, you're the ideal of an immigrant who has made good in America. You did it legally. Do you, uh, do you take exception with those who do it illegally and just cross the border? Well, I think doing the way you did, you're getting into semantics, you know, legally, illegally. I mean, people are moving from one country to the other because of uh, climate change, because of foreign policy that affects people. The United States sends money to dictators who are not taking care of those countries, encouraging conflicts. People moving from South America coming to uh, uh, America yeah. are people who often are running away from gangs, from bad governments. We just need to improve our foreign policy to ensure that we recognize that the American dream is what everybody uh, accesses here. America is the best country in the world in terms of democracy and freedom, and I'm a product of that, and I live it, and I think everybody is just coming here to live, well, not for economic purposes. Do you agree that we need a strong border, we need rules, we need a way to come in? Well, we already have that. We need to give people it's the It's broken, though. We see it on the news every night. It's broken. No, I mean, it's not, it's not broken because it was broken under Trump when he was separating parents and their children and right. imprisoning young people, children, 
who should be protected, who should be living with their families. But currently we see people being bossed in New York and Washington, and those are because the Biden administration has taken steps to ensure that immigrants are treated like humans and they are protected and that this country lives to its ideals which is a place for liberty and opportunities and where everybody can live and access the American Seth people. Magazine, it's been broken on the Democrats, Republican press, and it's been broken for a long time. Tonight, they're, dro they're flo flowing over the border unabated. Do you agree we have to stop that? We need an immigration system that is safe and orderly and fair. And that's what I'm going to work for uh, in Congress. You know, immigration reform used to be a bipartisan issue. Before Donald Trump came along, uh, we came really close to having a bipartisan immigration bill several times that Democrats and Republicans were able to join together uh, to fix our immigration system, to provide a path for those who are already here to earn their citizenship if they do the right thing, and also to have a more orderly legal immigration system and enforcement at the border. Um, when Trump came along, uh, he made the whole conversation toxic in Washington. Uh, what I want to do is go to Congress, <laughs> turn the page on Trumpism, and work across party lines for real immigration reform that, again, is safe, that is fair, that is orderly, and that provides people that path to opportunity, just like uh, all of our families had at one point or another. Uh, Sarah Morgatho, you worked in Washington many, many years, different agencies, uh, Homeland Security. Uh, it's broken. What's your idea to fix it? Well, first I want to start, my mother was an immigrant to this country, um, you know, escaping Nazi persecution, arriving here in 1941. So this is personal, and I believe that, you know, we are the land of opportunity. But I was at Homeland Security, and I worked uh, uh, at the southwest border. I worked closely with our Border Patrol, uh, making sure that our men and women had the resources that they needed uh, to protect our borders, because uh, we can't let everybody in. Uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we have a legal way to bring those who, who uh, belong here mm. uh, into this country. You know, the other thing that we have seen uh, uh, throughout the pandemic uh, and, and, and is really sort of accelerating is workforce shortage issues. Uh, and I think that that gives the promise of uh, bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform. I worked closely uh, right. with industry, with Republicans and Democrats as I was reopening travel and tourism for the country. And I think that there really is an opportunity for that. And I look forward to going to Washington and getting that passed. We need labor, but there's a way to do it. You would look to fix that. David Siegel, go ahead, jump in on this conversation. The board is broken. How would you fix it? So to start, I think that immigrants come here for a number of reasons. I think that once they are here, they want to be parts of our communities. They want to do well by themselves, their families, and their communities. Um, you know, my grandparents came over to escape pre-Nazi Poland, now Ukraine. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was bar mitzvahed on the boat on the way to Portland, Maine, and they opened up a grocery store. And during my time in the assembly, I did a lot of work to push back against the Tea Party backlash that was trying to institute all kinds of new regulations here to crack down on immigrants. I think there are many ways to tackle this problem. We, we need a, a legal path. Uh, we need a pathway for people who are here yeah. to be allowed to stay. We need more legal pathways to immigration. And I think much of what Omar spoke to at the beginning is really important. People also come here because of strife wherever they grew up. And that can be economic strife. And one thing that I would point to is the trade deals that those corporate special interests helped force into place to pit workers here against workers elsewhere and races to the bottom and decimated communities mm -hmm. here and elsewhere, immiserated people. That's one reason why people leave other places. People also leave other places because of strife, which goes to our foreign policy. And right. they're going to be leaving increasingly because of climate change. Okay. And we need to address all of those issues if we want a comprehensive solution to the question of why people want to leave one place and go to another place. Immigration is personal for all of us. We've all, one generation or another, <laughs> came from someone who decided to come here. Joy Fox, get in on this? Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, the bottom line is always about how we can make Rhode Island a place for all people to live and work. Um, and I think immigrants have, over generations, have strengthened the fabric of this state tremendously. Um, when I was working for Congressman Langevin, this was a problem back then. Uh, it's still a problem now. Our immigration system is broken. Mm. Um, we do need to find a pathway for people who are here now. We need to find, and um, we need to reform our visa system, and and we do need stronger, stronger border um, security as well. Those are all things together, um, and it all has to be done humanely. I think we've lost that right. um, in a in a very large way in our immigration system right now. So if um, I if I send you there, you win. Do you have an idea out of the box and get? Hey, look, everybody, get together. We got to. Here's, here's my. Yeah. 
yeah, to everybody it. get together. And it's it's talking to Omar and his his team at the Refugee Dream Center and bringing other members of the community along with me to start these conversations and reach across the aisle. All right, you'll all go down there if you get there to the vote on matters of war and peace. We're embroiled in a conflict in Ukraine, not directly, but we're feeding it. And China could at any moment decide that they want to take over Taiwan. Alan Fung, by the way, says he's particularly interested in what goes on there. He has Chinese ancestry. He's been to that part of the world. He's been to Taiwan. He really wants to get on top of that. Omar Ba, would you put troops on the ground in Taiwan if the Chinese go in, fight them hand to hand? Well, I mean, we're already dealing with this situation in Ukraine, and we have not put uh, boots on the ground. Uh, what I, my approach is not military, but our influences, our uh, talks of influence to ensure that we use all the forms of influence rather than military. That should be a last resort because you cannot have big powers like America and Ukraine, sorry, America and Russia or America no. and China fighting. That means a, a third world war. We cannot uh, afford that. So what we need to do is preventative approaches. Currently, what we've seen what happened during uh, Nancy Pelosi's uh, trip to Taiwan. Yeah. That, was go that was very close to uh, some sort of military conflict, potentially. Yeah. And China is, is complicit in the current war in Ukraine because they're not supporting the efforts to uh, punish Putin for his dictatorship and trying to destroy an entire country. And the next last thing we want is another military conflict with the superpower. So proxy war, just what we're doing in uh, Ukraine now. Joy Absolutely. Fox, proxy war, would you put boots on the ground in Taiwan? It is no secret that democracy is under threat around the world. And um, again, my, there are three ways that I would think about this. Diplomacy first. Diplomacy um, is the preferred way to go um, in any situation. Second, um, we need to continue to support our allies, whether they are in, um, in Ukraine or Taiwan. Um, we, are, we have seen um, NATO uh, have a resurgence and be, being strengthened, uh, and that is a good thing. Um, and we also need to keep a strong national defense. Um, and I would say that my bar is extremely high for deploying troops anywhere. Okay. Uh, my brother is a United States Navy veteran, and we know what it's like when he served overseas, and there are many families like here in Rhode Island. I would also lastly say we have a tremendous expert in our delegation in Senator Jack Reed, and he, um, he is someone that I right. would uh, look forward to working with on all of these issues. Seth Magazine, a boots yeah. on the ground if the Chinese go in. Uh, so, first of all, a tremendous debt of gratitude to all Rhode Island men and women who have served or are serving our country. Uh, democracy is under threat um, to a greater degree today than at any time in our lifetimes, mm -hmm. um, certainly any time since the Cold War. And what Vladimir Putin has done in Ukraine, invading a peaceful democratic ally of the United States, cannot stand. And so, in that situation and in any similar situation, uh, we need to take a tough response. We need to support sanctions to cripple the economies of countries that um, dictators that seek to invade okay. democratic countries. We need to provide military and technical assistance to our allies, support our alliances like NATO. You know, under President Trump, uh, our allies were vilified and he cozied up to dictators. That's part of what emboldened right. the Vladimir Putins of the world. On China and Taiwan. The question was boots yeah. on the ground if the so Chinese same, win. So the same approach. Quickly. Yeah, so same approach. <laughs> Listen, um, boots on the ground is an absolute last resort. Okay. You start with technical and military assistance, with intelligence assistance, and with diplomatic sanctions and economic sanctions on the aggressor. Okay, I want to get both of you, and then it's getting time to go to closing statements. Sarah Morgenthau? You know, I, I thank uh, our men and women who are in our troops, uh, and I think we need to uh, make sure that any decision that we make uh, to send them uh, into harm's way that we take very seriously. I am pleased uh, that uh, Speaker Pelosi and some other members of the congressional delegation went to Taiwan and met with President Tsai. I think that's an important um, uh, act of diplomacy. I think that there are soft skills uh, that can be used uh, right. before we go in uh, with, with military forces. But, you know, absolutely, you know, the situation in, in Ukraine uh, is heartbreaking. It is riveting. I am I am uh, very pleased that President Biden uh, did what he did and brought our NATO alliances okay. together. I know a thing or two about this, having uh, been uh, working at the Peace Corps uh, when Crimea w uh, was invaded by Russia in 2014. And I think it's important that we have that global perspective and understanding that these are real issues uh, and, and, it, and we have to take it very seriously. So I'm, here, I'm hearing proxy before any hard boots on the ground. How about you, David Siegel? I mean, it would obviously be a horrendous circumstance for that invasion to happen. Military action is always going to be a last resort. 
the first thing we would need to do is bring together the international community, uh, depending on whatever the particular circumstances were. But if we're talking about dealing with China more generally, and I, I think we need to talk about how to deal with China more generally, mm -hmm. we have essentially a global uh, debate between two different systems of governance and economics. And the way that we win that debate is by demonstrating that our system is better. Internally, that means things like elevating democracy and pushing back against okay. anti-democratic impulses. Also having an industrial policy so that we take care of our people and so that we're manufacturing things here uh, rather than areas where there's potential global strife. So for instance, outsourcing microchip manufacturing to yes. Taiwan was not a very wise decision yeah. and it's good that we're taking measures to reverse that. The other thing that we need to yeah. be doing that China is doing very well is steward countries that are in their economic orbit. And we could be doing a lot more around vaccine diplomacy. We could be doing a lot more to support other economies during uh, their um, the let reserve me, crisis let during me just, COVID. Let me, well, just and, go ahead and wrap because okay. we're getting close. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and one thing that Jan Yellen did very well, um, and I was yeah. engaged with the Treasury on this, was encourage the IMF without using any taxpayer dollars to help buck up the financial systems and nations abroad gotta, gotta and to help them it. contend with COVID. We need to be doing more things like that if we're going to win this debate. Show of hands, who would support Speaker Pelosi for another term? Who thinks President Biden should run for re-election? Oh, That's interesting. You had a half and half there. Are you willing to be <laughs> brave and say you don't think so? You would agree with most in your party? Yeah, I, I, what I'd say is uh, what I said this morning, so sorry if this is repetitious, but I, I think I do agree with most in my party, which is to say it's too early to say. Um, and I think that we have seen a track record of recent success okay. that's really promising that needs to be built upon and would bode well for him and for all of us, whoever makes it to the general, if but we continue to do so. Seth, God, you were trying to get in here, but go ahead. We're gonna to go to closings, but you think the president should run? I was run raising again. my hand with everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> all right. You think the president should run Joy Fox? He should run Omar Ba, he should run. I would no, add, I'm if not. he wants to run. What are you saying, Omar? If he wants, he can, but I'm not. If, if he, he should wants be left to, to yeah. the people, it's a democracy. Yeah. 30 seconds. Gene, I just wanna say, uh, uh, for the record here that several weeks ago when poll numbers were lower uh, for President Biden, that I was the only one uh, who uh, went on the record to say that I would support uh, President Biden in 2024. You're right. I think we need to send leaders uh, to Washington who are decisive, who are experienced, who, who will make the right decisions for folks here. I've got because a, it's not easy in Washington. I've got a and we it. need someone who can fight like heck and bring things back to, right. to, to, to our communities. Here. Hard move to the closing arguments by order of the draw. Omar Ba addressed his camera. You have one minute. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, my candidacy here was about voice. And uh, you all know I've been caught from another platform and tried to deny me a voice, but I'm happy to be here to have that voice. From the day I entered this race, I've been told that I do not belong by people in power. And, you know, I do not have the luxury like Sarah uh, to come here and I uh, saw my home and use that to pretend he, she lives here. I don't know, have also the luxury like Joy to live here, to be born and raised in Rhode Island, like Joy and my children. I certainly do not have the luxury like Seth to, be, to have his, my campaign underwritten by millions by my own uh, parents that I have not been able to explain. So when these people were having these privileges, I did not have that privilege, but I am happy that in my past life, I was working to fight and protect women. And I spoke out against a dictator, and during that time, my reward was arrest, torture, and taken out by a killer squad. So this election is about choice. Send somebody who understands Thank the you. issues and rather than people who are career politicians. Thank you, Omar. Next is David Siegel. Closing one minute, please address this camera. Thank you. Um, it's great to have these conversations about moments where we agree, and also the very important moments where we disagree. Um, and core to what's at stake in this race is addressing why it is so hard to make progress on the issues of the day, especially where not only Democrats agree, but also where independents and even some Republicans are with us. And we all know why this is the case. It's because corporate special interests and political corruption rule the day in Washington. And we all know that, and we need to fix it. And as I've spoken to tonight, over the course of the last 20 years, at the local level and the state level here, and at the national level, I've learned how to build coalitions that can push back and overcome those forces and deliver wins for everyday people. And no matter what we talk about on a stage like this one, if we don't address those underlying systems, none of it matters. None of it's going to happen. So I'm running for Congress to address those underlying systems 
to elevate our voices in the policymaking process, and it's why I ask for your vote. Thank you. David, S David Siegel, thank you. Treasurer Magaziner, one minute. This campaign and this election is not about any of us on this stage. It's about you at home. We need our next member of Congress to fight to lower the cost of health care, to protect Social Security and Medicare, to bring manufacturing jobs and clean energy jobs to our state. We need our next member of Congress to fight to preserve a woman's right to make her own health care decisions without interference from politicians. And we need our next member of Congress to protect our democracy against Donald Trump and the extremists who look to undermine us. As state treasurer for the last eight years, I've worked in every community across the 2nd Congressional District. The school construction program that I launched is building new elementary schools in Johnston and Cranston. The clean energy programs that I've started have helped the town of West Warwick not pay an electric bill on its municipal buildings in five years. We strengthened retirement security, fought to raise wages, and lower health care costs. Our campaign is supported by Congressman Langevin, by the National Organization for Women, the League of Conservation Voters, unions that represent firefighters and teachers and nurses, and I ask you to join us as well. We have to keep this seat in Democratic control. Join our campaign and help us, help us do it by going to SethMagaziner.com. Thank you, Treasurer. Joy Fox, one minute. Thank you, Gene, for having us tonight, and thank you to the viewers for tuning in. These are challenging times, and people are struggling. And often I'm asked, how can we just make Washington work? If we want Washington to work, we have to change the kind of people we send there. We don't need more people with trust funds or who can lend their campaigns hundreds of thousands of dollars. My experience working for the Cranston Herald, for Congressman Langevin, Governor Raimondo, and running a small business now give me a unique and strong understanding of this district and how to use that experience to move the ball forward on housing, education, health care, and so much more. It is time to send the first Democratic woman to Congress. And I also know that we need to keep this seat blue. I am the only one up here that has been on part of a team that has beaten Alan Fung twice. We can do it again, and I'm pretty sure he knows it too. So I ask for your vote on September 13th. And remember, don't lose hope and send joy to Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Joy Fox. Sarah Morgenthau, closing statement, one minute. Thank you to the viewers for tuning in tonight. Three things. I am the strongest candidate to beat Alan Fung in November. We cannot afford to lose this seat. There is too much at stake. I have experience working for two presidents and will be able to get things done starting on day one. I worked for Homeland Security, on cybersecurity, counterterrorism, domestic terrorism, uh, natural disasters, something Rhode Island knows a thing or two about. I reopened travel and tourism for the United States. That's $7 billion coming into Rhode Island. That's a heck of a lot of jobs and other economic benefits. We have an opportunity to send the first Democratic woman to Congress from Rhode Island. We need to take that opportunity. We need to seize that opportunity. We need to stop the fighting, stop the noise, and get things done. I would be honored to serve you, and I hope I get your vote on September 13th. Sarah Morgan, so thank you, and thanks to all the candidates for coming in and engaging with me in a frank discussion. I think I hope the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we encourage you to vote. One of these candidates will go up against Alan Fung, and that will be, I guess, the next debate. But before that, we will have a debate for Lieutenant Governor. I'm taping it tomorrow. All of the candidates in that race, with the exception of Lieutenant Governor Sabina Matos, have agreed to join us in studio to tape that. We hope the Lieutenant Governor changes her mind. There's still time for that. In the meantime, our debates will be presented once again on TurnTo10.com. If you missed any of this, they'll be on TurnTo10.com in their entirety. It's a big night politically. The President, right after this, will address the nation from Philadelphia on what he sees as the dangers of the, to democracy. Thanks for being with us. I'll see you on the news.